You are listening to Missed Apex Podcast. We live F1. Welcome to Missed Apex Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Reddy, but my friends call me Spanners. So, let's be friends. This is a magazine show. Later in the show, we're going to catch up with Samuel Coop from Formula Nerds to get a rundown of what's been going on in the Junior Series over the course of 2022. And we're going to catch up with Matt and Kyle, who are going to talk about Forbidden F1 technology. But we are an independent podcast produced in the podcasting shed with the kind permission of our better halves. We aim to bring you a race review before your Monday morning commute. We might be wrong, but we're first. But we are going to start by talking about some cost cap news. I don't think we've actually talked about it on this feed yet, but it might have just grabbed your attention that there has been talk in the F1 paddock that Red Bull might have exceeded the budget cap for 2021. And in this partisan fan space, there are many raging that Red Bull should be banished to the shadow realm for their crimes against finances. Not so, say Red Bull fans as they pull out an Uno reverse card and say, all Red Bull did was buy some extra crisps. So I need to be clear, we don't know the details of the breach. It could be $1, it could be $7 million, there could be valid reasons, it could be a misunderstanding, but any wild speculation is entirely the fault of the FIA. They farted in the lift and then got out on the next floor. So what I do want to make sure is that we're not stuck in a Mercedes or ham bubble. Uh, I'm also joined here by my co-host Matt. Two rumpets. Hey, Matt. Me and Kyle, what could possibly go wrong? (laughs) You and Kyle talking about forbidden tech after (laughs) this cost cap news. But we are joined first to make sure that we're not in an echo chamber. We're joined by an ex-Red Bull staffer turned internet meme factory and podcaster. Engine Mode 11 joins us here. It is uh, Dan Drury. Welcome, Dan, to The Shed. Good morning. Good Mm. afternoon and good evening, depending on what time you're listening. And it is very, very magnanimous of me to invite you on even though you are now a deadly podcast rival. I know, yep, yep. It's, um, we're building bridges, Spanners. Yeah, but you, that, that doesn't mean you're not a hated enemy. Not only are you a rival podcaster, but a, a broadly Red Bull-based podcast as well, with you and a former Red Bull employee also. That is correct, yes. It's me and uh, Blake. We're two ex-Red Bull engineers. We've created our own podcast, and it's the most fraudulent and probably unprofessional <laughs> podcast going. Does it always have a dog in the background like you've got now? Uh, that's sometimes optional. <laughs> so if you like you know, Red Bull and dogs constantly in the background, then go and check out Engine Braking. But Dan, I have to you know, find out from you because possibly I'm in a bit of an echo chamber on my social media. But how are you speak for all Red Bull fans now? How are Red Bull fans taking the FIA drop? Well, I'm not sure if that's a crown that I want to wear, but uh, (laughs) I shall wear it for this episode. Um, I think most people don't really seem to care in the Red Bull fandom. They they seem to come back with arguments of, oh, well, what about Spygate? What about the 2008 Singapore crash? Look what happened there. And it's a completely different kettle of fish. It's a new era. These are new rules. This isn't technical. This isn't Mm. sporting. This is financial. So it's something new that's coming. And I will try to remain balanced. And I will say that I am disappointed to hear that they were the only team to do this. Uh, But also realistically, now I've not been employed with them for a year, I can also say I'm not exactly surprised either. Oh, okay. Okay. I think we need to pull on that thread as well. Because obviously I was going to ask you, uh, I never want tittle tattle or, or gossip. I'm never trying to get that inside scoop. But you were invited to leave Red Bull in 2020? Uh, the end of 2021. Oh, yeah. end of so 2021. My son was born, uh, and I think I did two weeks of paternity and realised that those two weeks were probably the best two weeks I've had in yeah. a few years. And I thought, you know what? I'm done. See you later. There's going to be a lot that of, I that. think, team members doing that once the, the calendar increases as well. You know, I've, I've in the background I've been in, you know, some people suddenly go, I've not seen my kid for eight months. This isn't this isn't actually the, the life I want. So that's interesting in of itself. But I did wonder, like, is there a much more 
let's really push out the envelope and the grey areas approach from Red Bull than some other teams? Uh, I think that's always been Red Bull's MO, really. If you think of a team that's, you know, going to stretch the boundaries, loopholes and grey areas, it's your first thing team you're going to think of is Red Bull, really, aren't you? So I'm not surprised. I think you mean aggressively interpret <laughs> the regulations, don't you? Yeah, any doesn't equal all or whatever that uh, <laughs> yeah. rule said. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we've got to be careful not to go into the realms of, yeah, well, we'd expect this of Red Bull because this is what they're, they're like. Uh, but you touched upon some of those uh, grey areas that people were speculating about. I, I think it is important to emphasise again that because of the way the FIA put it out, Matt, we don't, we don't have any evidence for... But the rumours are strong that it's around one to two million overspend. Yeah, I mean, there the rumors have been broadly accurate, both in terms of the teams that were named and the teams that the FIA named, and sort of uh, what was going on with each of those teams. So you do have to take the numbers with a fair degree of, I guess we'll call it salt, with a couple of grains, not just the one grain of salt. But <laughs> it also just occurs to me that I don't think you would see this kind of pushback from Red Bull if they were 150 pounds over. An agreement would have been reached with the cost cap administration to pay a small fine, and that would have just been the end of it. It's got to be a big enough number that they, they have to make a fuss about it because they know that if they don't, the punishment will potentially be more severe than, than they would like their team to undergo. I was trying to put myself genuinely in the position of saying, well, okay, what if Hamilton had won the 2021 championship and then they'd found out that there'd been a $2 million overspend? And obviously it'd be easy for me to sit here and say, I I would be outraged, Dan. I would be calling for that championship to be reversed. But I don't know. I think I'd be sort of just trying to stay under the radar, really, seeing seeing how it shaked out. Yeah, it's, it's odd for me as an individual because obviously I've got an emotional connection yeah. to it. I think I've been pretty open and out on Twitter and said that I've seen during 2021, we've had people be made redundant, things like that. People that have worked there for 10 years, all of a sudden are told, see you later, your position's untenable. So then to go through that sort of emotion, nor uh, not trauma, but you know what I mean, mm. that, that experience. And then a year later, find out, well, we went over the cap anyway. It, it sort of leaves you a bit of a sting. What was the perception before that cost cap came in? You know, did, did Red Bull feel, like I think a lot of people, that Mercedes had this unfair advantage in resources anyway? I don't think it was necessarily in terms of unfair resources. I think the biggest crux that they had was the fact they didn't have a in-house PU department. So although they were working very closely with Honda, Honda were based in Sakura in Japan. So that is it's difficult to be on the same time zone, obviously, and have a fluid um, dynamic between them. Whereas Mercedes, I mean, it's like an hour's drive between their PU department and the F1 team. So I think that was the major sticking point for Red Bull in terms of how they felt they weren't on that level with Mercedes. Um, but in terms of monetary, uh, I think, I don't know what the figures are off the top of my head, but I don't think they'd have been that far off each other. Yeah, well, one of the things that occurs to me to ask is that you are, and you know, we're talking about our media bubbles here, but you also, and, and you've mentioned this, your own feelings, but, but you know former and current employees. Uh -huh. Do you have the temperature at all of, of how the team members are taking this? And I'm not talking about the members at the top of the team because their public stance is yeah, fairly Derek's. obvious. We want to know but what the Derek's think, about. don't we? <laughs> exactly. Derek Turnipson working down there on the bench. How's he feeling about this? Um, as similar to probably how I felt when I went, oh, of course it's us. <laughs> sort of thing, you know, <laughs> like, <clears throat> who else would it be? So, yeah, uh, it's a shame. Like I said, I think there there is an undercurrent of disappointment, I think, in, in the people that are in the lower ranks. Oh, really? So, like, there is a feeling of, of being a little bit let down by the overspend. And I suppose that would be true whether it was a malicious, deliberate cheat or if it was, like, carelessly overspending two million. I think the disappointment would be equal, you know, much like a bodged pit stop or a whole season of bodged pit stops. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 
I'm really also annoyed. Here we go. We're going to get. Oh, here we go. Come lot. on. Let's get yeah, some good stuff. We're going to get you up. lot banned now from FIA accreditation. <laughs> but uh, I've put the FIA on blast because the statement they came out with is so wishy washy. It tells you nothing. It just goes, oh, it's a minor overspend. So it could be up to $7 million, but we're not going to tell you any more than that. <laughs> yes. We have pulled the pin out of that grenade. Good luck, the internet. And then it just went home for lunch. But but say say it was like a really small overspend, like a dollar, and they did that. They've damaged Red Bull's reputation an awful lot by, by not saying what the figure is and left all this speculation. Now, you could just say, well, they're unaware of the effect of the, what their statement would have on social media and Red Bull's reputation. Or, well, I don't know, it feels a little bit like that would be the exact way to hurt Red Bull in that exact specific specific way. Yeah, the FI haven't really been on um, top form since Abu Dhabi 2021, and they continue to deliver. Um, I just want Max Verstappen to clinch a championship in a race that doesn't end in us all reading oh, regulations. No. You know? well, well, this is it. Uh, we we have we do have the odd uh, Max Verstappen fan in our Patreon Slack group, and th- that was their overriding sense on Sunday after the Japanese Grand Prix was disappointment. A at the way it was dished out, everybody's reaction to that, uh, and then I think you know the Leclerc last minute. Oh, we got a penalty, which also handed it to him, and the points of difference to what you thought, and then have the cost cap thing released on Monday. I think there is a sense that from a fan point of view you've been robbed and neither the F1 fans neither the Verstappen fans or Max Verstappen has done a single thing wrong in in any of those controversies yes yeah he I don't know if he's broken some mirrors or (laughs) perhaps maybe that was the deal he made with the devil for his talent I don't know uh but yeah like you say um he won the championship on Sunday and I think by Monday we all forgot and since then it's just been about the cost cap yeah, well, it has been. It has been. So any attempt to not have it overshadowed has has certainly failed. Matt, yeah, absolutely. Also. Yeah, I'm going to say this is just Max's fault because he drove so well this season. I mean, like it was like those seasons with Vettel, and then subsequently with Hamilton, where the race would start and then they'd be three quarters of a lap ahead, and they barely get any TV <laughs> time because their race was just like <laughs> like literally they're just sitting there playing on their Nintendo Switch the end of the race because it's that obvious you're going to win it was exciting the first half of the season but it was clearly clearly going to be him and mm. that doesn't help your you know when it comes down to the last race everyone talks about it for a long time yeah so i'm going to give you my spicy reply to that matt and say is that max's fault or is that ferrari's fault yes <laughs> yeah well oh, it- yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is what I was saying on a different podcast was that really Red Bull's major strength has just been a lack of weaknesses. And that's been the difference this year. You had three teams with the potential to come out of the box fighting in this regulation set, and two of them dropped the ball badly. And so Red Bull didn't need to be as good as they were, but really they had just this overall package that was great, and then they delivered it, and their drivers delivered as well. And all of that has been overshadowed, probably un- possibly unfairly, because we don't know if they did anything wrong. But let's wildly speculate that they definitely did stuff wrong, Dan. There is, yes. there is an yep. offence. An offence has been identified. So yep. obviously we can wildly speculate about the, the range of punishment. Let's say it was $2 billion, and you could, you could see it wasn't on crisps, It was used on upgrades. It was a genuine mistake, but they have overspent on their upgrades. What should the punishment be? Um, Reduction of wind tunnel time, reduction of cost cap. I'd say it depends on the amount they've gone over, but Mm. two million. How much is a constructor's point worth these days? Isn't (laughs) one point worth one million? Well, I think the question is, what, what, what upgrades do you reckon you could bring with two million dollars? I reckon you could probably squeeze a front wing or two in there. Is that all? For two million? Well, uh, you've got to think, like, it's development costs. Each front wing has to be destroyed before it can go on the car because they have to understand how it fails. Uh, so it's not just one wing, as it were. There's been several of them that have been smashed about. So so what about the Mercedes claims that, well, after, they, after Silverstone, you know, Silverstone was their last upgrade, and um, none of them could even afford gloves, their own gloves. They had to use like the gardening gloves that you get at the local go-kart track. That's all the gloves they were using for racing. Whereas Red Bull were coming in with gold-plated upgrades. 
race after Max's race. golden shoes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Are they part of the cost cap? The golden boots. So yeah. is that is that hyperbole from Mercedes? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, Toto has a good point. I think Toto likes to ham it up a little bit because it gets under Christian's skin. <laughs> I can't blame him. Frankly, I enjoy it, watching them two go at it. Uh, but <laughs> he does have a point, so, you know. Yeah, I, I think, you again, you have to take anything uh, Toto or Bernardo is going to say. You, you have to assume they have cooked the numbers to look as good as possible. The, the reality in terms of what it brought to Red Bull, my guess would be somewhere in between. It was just on crisps and oh, that was easily worth 17 seconds of lap time, <laughs> which seems to be the Mercedes argument. Yeah, I, this whole food thing. <laughs> I was going to ask. Us, yeah. So at Red Bull, and apparently other teams don't do this, which I didn't know about. But we have, um, or had, should I say, an allowance of like, I think it was a five pound a day or whatever, and you can go and mm. buy your lunch with it in a staff canteen. But my, that's not my issue. My issue here is, why is food in the cost cap anyway? Like, yeah. I don't understand that. That that is weird, but I don't know. You can't gain a performance advantage, can you? Out of um, out of better sandwiches. No, well, can you? I don't know. Maybe the FIA knows something we don't. But the fact that we're all sitting here talking about food and catering is wild to me. Uh, Matt, though, wasn't that rumor specifically sourced from like one Dutch journalist? Yeah, okay. it, it was. Red Bull haven't claimed this. No, yeah. they haven't claimed where where no one has claimed exactly where the categories are. These come to us from that mainly from that one article. But I'm just curious: as part of your irritation at Red Bull at this point, you feel like they should be making better excuses than the cafeteria. Hundred percent. How can you stand there with your chest? Well, they haven't. But if if Christian goes to the U.S. Grand Prix and stands there and goes, "Yes, we bought too many sandwiches." I'm going to drive to MK myself <laughs> and have some stern words. Okay, yeah, okay. I I don't think that's got any cred, um, you know, any credibility. Those no, rumors about the that... the food. Well, because I've seen people online going, well, that's because Red Bull feed their staff. Actually, like like the Mercedes employees are going. Please, I haven't yeah. got the energy to finish this front wing. Please give me one more dessert. If you wanted any evidence that Red Bull feed their staff well, all you have to do is take one look at me. Go and follow Dan at Engine Mode Eleven on Twitter, and you keep posting naked pictures of yourself in a paddling pool, which um, I'm not complaining. Well, you know, just got to get in that Miami vibe. All right, but that's what we got to do to get to the top to match his seventy thousand Twitter followers, Matt. It's all, I, yeah. I think he saw how that Botas picture worked out and is just trying to ride that. All right. Okay. We'll get in touch with our PR team, Matt, and uh, just stand by for a photographer to turn up. This is going to be awful. <laughs> so that's the kind of crisps rumor addressed there, Dan. I wondered what you might think about the Adrian Newey rumor that perhaps there was some kind of fudge between him being a staff member or his firm being subcontracted. Can you shed some light on that? Uh, yeah. So the firm in question I saw on Twitter, I think it was racing services limited um that's the company he uses to run and look after his historic race cars so uh. that that kind of knocked that one on the head straight away um now i don't obviously i don't know what adrian's employment contract looks like uh he might be sitting under red bull advanced technologies because that was his baby that whole project came about to keep adrian happy so I don't know how that works with the cost cap if he sits under advanced technologies. I'm, I'm trying to think of some scenario where how that would work. So advanced technologies pay him, but Red Bull only pay advanced technologies, say, a, a small amount for services, which just happen to include the genius mind of Adrian Newey. Yeah, so uh, when I worked there, um, I actually did a lot of work for all the various parts mm. of Red Bull racing. There's, there's loads of parts. And I actually had to do timesheets and work out to the half hour, how much work I'd done on that day towards F1 related activities. So they could accost my time to the budget cap. And immediately I want to know which entity paid for you your time to do the timesheets. Uh, that would be Red Bull Technology. Wow. Is that, is that, is that a dun 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 moment? I don't think so. No? No. Okay. <laughs> Pretty much everyone at the factory is either Red Bull technology or Red Bull powertrains. Yeah. The Red Bull racing side of it is really only the race team. 
So yeah. Well, there you go. I thank you for for coming into the the shed into the bear pit and bringing your echo chambers view. I, I really don't like the way it was done because it's normally toxic on F1 Twitter these days, but it's really bad at the moment. And on the one hand, you know, people like you and me want to be on Twitter expressing our views. On the other hand, you sort of type things and you go, oh, what effect is that going to have? And as, as wild as you or I's Twitter feeds may look at the moment, I know both you and I have a lot more sitting in our drafts. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> there, is, there is definitely not, <laughs> definitely not a tweet sitting there ready to go that says two million dollars could have bought some side pods for the W13. Uh, yeah, and I definitely yeah. don't have um, a meme where I photoshopped uh, Christian Horner's face onto a Family Fortunes contestant um, asking the question. You know, what was the cost cap? You said 160 million. <laughs> our survey said I haven't done that. It's definitely sitting in my drafts. Uh, but Dan. Uh, Engine Mode 11, your podcast is called Engine Breaking. There's a link in the show notes below if you want to go in and check that out. See, I am not anti-Red Bull. I've got one Red Bull friend. See? Yeah, see? And that's how that works. Dan, thanks so much <laughs> for your time and thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Over to you, Matt. Hi, I'm Matt Trumpet, and joining me today is none other than Kyle Power, who, in addition to being a driver analyst and map karting champion, and a karting champion in his own right, is also a proper mad scientist type engineer, harnessing the fundamental powers of the universe for what I assume is probably not evil. <laughs> I would love to be able to live up to that epic introduction, but unfortunately I'm just a pen pusher now. Just a boring, humble quality engineer now. As we all know from Formula One, once you have the knowledge, it never goes away. <laughs> I so wish that was true but I do have a very, very keen interest in some of the more uh, nefarious and dark areas of Formula One tech. Well, we're about to get to that, but before we do, I also just need to give a quick shout out to Summer's F1, Matthew Summerfield, technical editor at motorsport.com, for helping us a bit with research for this segment. And we do, as you have alluded to, have a special treat today, a deep dive into some tech that was so outrageous, expensive, and ridiculous that it was banned from Formula One for ever. So normally when I say the words exhaust and blown and diffuser, people don't get that excited. And they usually tend to make juvenile jokes, if I'm being honest. But I got to tell you, Kyle, I'm super excited to talk about this because as I was getting deeper into Formula One, as I was beginning to discover the engineering and technical side of the sport, this, this exhaust blown diffuser was all the rage. And I loved it. The Kawanda effect. Like, I don't know if you remember this, but I remember just standing there with like a spoon in my kitchen and the aerodynamics talking about spoke to things with Bernoulli principle, things that I'd learned as a musician that were suddenly showing up in a sport that I was thoroughly enjoying and loving watching. And it kind of started me on that that path, that journey to really learning about the engineering side of Formula One. Absolutely. I'm very, very similar. I was, uh, I was stood by the side of the track in 2011 and just fascinated by the massively different noises I was hearing from the cars. And I was like, why, why do they sound so, so different? So I looked into it and it's at the height of what we know as the exhaust blown diffuser era in sort of 2010 and 2011. But looking more deeply into it, it goes back an awful long way and they've always been around, but this is what I'd love. And I'm equally excited to talk about this because it's, it's a tech that you can't really see. You can't really see sort of visually. It's quite hard to see with the exhaust sort of exits, but then you can really, really hear it. And of course you can see the massive performance differential it gave to some of the cars and it's really, really exciting. And of course, what's almost sounds too good to be true usually is when the FIA is concerned. So they will, um, they got their meddling hands in it and there's quite a lot of politics behind and how they banned it. So I think exhaust blown diffusers to start off with is an absolutely fascinating subject. Well, it is. And, and one of the, one of the things I learned, it was very interesting was how long this technology has been around and sort of the origination of it, like why it came about really goes sort of all the way back to the, the ground effect era. But I also learned that there was a lot of driver skill involved in making that exhaust blown diffuser work correctly. And that persisted even up into the era that we're going to mainly focus on. Oh, incredibly. Yeah, massively. So, so yeah, it, it came about 
amazingly early, around about 1983, with the Renault RE40. Um, and this is like most things in Formula One, like most cool sort of tech developments. The engineers are scratching around, trying to find ways of recovering downforce that has been taken from them and stolen from them. So as you mentioned, the ground effect era had just had just finished in 83, and they, it was the first year that they were sort of um, they were forced to use flat bottom cars. And so the design and the engineers are like, oh, um, where usually they'll be trying to move the exhaust, the high stream jet of exhaust energy, and it's an inconvenience. They're trying to move it to non-influential places. They've suddenly had a little light bulb and like, ding, we've just had all our rear downforce and all our downforce stolen from us from the floor. Oh, I've got this high energy stream of, of hot air, which was an inconvenience. Maybe I could conveniently place it. Yeah, well, I mean, the fact that there were already diffusers is is obvious when you think about it. But most people, it wouldn't have occurred to them that that even back then, the diffuser was a thing used. But I always imagine, like, you know, in Men in Black, Will Smith going, guys, 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 is that a spaceship? There must have been some engineer just poking around. And one day he goes, guys, 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 what if we just routed the exhaust under the floor right into the diffuser? And, and, and people were like, nah. Ah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, just maybe. Until probably some of the drivers drove it for the first time and they were just like, are you guys insane? Like, <laughs> I'm on the throttle and have lots of downforce. As soon as I get off the throttle, I have none. Yeah, because of course, the obvious problem with just routing your, your, your exhaust right there is that the moment you stop pushing the throttle, the exhaust stops going through. So where are you going to be off throttle? Fuck. Well, Going into a corner, where do you want the downforce to be very consistent? <laughs> Going into a corner. So it must have been mad the first time they had those things out on track. Yeah, it must be absolutely crazy. And so if we go back, like it's genius for the engineers to think of this. And I would love to be in the design office and the person, as you say, just like, guys, have you thought about this? And everyone trying to write it off and slowly coming to the realization of this could be very, very, very powerful. Let's use it. Um and then, yeah, I would love to be there. And I'd also love to be there on the first debrief when they're saying, yes, I, look, we can see we've produced loads of downforce in a specific area where we kind of don't need it. And we need it in another area. So there's obviously different ways of implementing this. But what it's primarily brought in for was to try to recover the lost downforce from the ground effects, which they don't have anymore by energizing massively the diffuser. Because, of course, an exhaust is a massively high stream of very hot exhaust gases so if you can push that into the diffuser one you're putting airflow through the diffuser and also air is quite sticky isn't it so i guess it's grabbing other air and trying to pull that through it as well yeah well and this is a problem that you have with the diffuser that's been solved lots of different ways is that in order for the air to go fast you essentially create a high pressure zone that starts at the front wing and then happens again if you think about like the high rake red bull right where the air passes uh, it starts passing the the nose uh, of the boat mm -hmm. section there where the plank is. You create these high pressure areas. Behind it, you have air that moves very fast, but it's also very low pressure air. So as it gets to the diffuser and is spread out even more, it starts to become a problem extracting all that air. Now, if you take an energized amount of uh, air, like from the exhaust, say, and you chunk it up under there, you're going to suck a load more air through that low pressure section, which is going to just increase the downforce. And that's essentially what was going on. Yeah. So obviously, like the first sort of thing, if I was trying to, if I'd suddenly had that sort of eureka moment, I was like, okay. And as you said, like, yeah, in the first sort of Renault, they're firing the exhaust plumes directly into the diffuser. And these diffusers were just one single diffuser. They're not split up like they were back in sort of um, 2010. So you would initially put it there and it sounds fantastic, but subsequently as it's gone through several evolutions over the years, they've subsequently found out that's not the best place to kind of put the air. So they've actually come through and tried it. So we saw it first, what do you reckon on, yeah, it was the 83 Renault. Right. And then it's, and then it's sort of come, it's sort of gone away and come back again. So the, you know, obviously they can't make it work consistently. You've got massive um, drivability issues. So it seems like a golden ticket. It's giving you loads of extra downforce. But the drawback of not exactly when you need it and the drivability issues, the drivers are having a nightmare trying to keep it energized. Because, of course, the exhaust is only going to be firing out hot 
exhaust gases, you're only going to have them passing when you're on the throttle. So this is one of the major, major issues of the exhaust plane diffusers that remained unsolved. But even so, people were still trying to solve it all the way into the 90s still and still couldn't quite get on top of it. So it was uh, Benetton in 95, he yeah. said, which who were trying it with, um, with Schumacher and Braun. Yeah, well, and one of the things that was really helpful, and, and again, one of those interesting things is that it turns out that when you stick a turbocharger on an engine, it tends to level out the velocity of your exhaust gases a lot. And I think that's because, well, because it's been, because the turbocharger turbine sits in the exhaust in order to, um, in order to, because the exhaust here, I'll, I'll say the words right in a minute, because the exhaust is what spins the turbine of the turbocharger. It evens out the speed across the RPM range. And, and that had been one of the bigger sticking points, I think, up until there. Yeah. So you've got a turbo spooling. You've got a constant sort of pressure almost. It's almost like a buffer at a gate. You've almost got like a header tank. So you've got a constant back, back pressure of there. So it's going to keep the pressure coming out of it, after it, more consistent when it comes out. So turbo engines kind of lean themselves to it. So, of course, this is back in 83. This is in the turbo era. The Renault were using the turbo engines. And, of course, when the turbo engines eventually were got rid of in 88, I believe, when the turbo engines were gone, they were all going back to naturally aspirated engines. Um, yeah, so the exhaust gases were a bit less consistent. And maybe this whole sort of technology was a bit less desirable as well. So um, just remind me that this is when they had... The skirts were in the 70s, weren't they? Skirts were in the 70s, and, and then they got rid of the skirts for safety reasons. Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, there's the flat bottom, and then this is what brought in to yeah. the to the diffusers. Yeah, so when you get into the 90s, you've now got the nas naturally aspirated engines. You've got a whole myriad of wonderfuls. You've got V8s up to V12s and everything, and it's all good. You've still got a lot of flat bottoms up to 94 which is when they started putting the plank and the step into the bottom of the car and traditionally then the exhaust was still kind of exiting around the rear suspension and you could see it I remember on the videos from the 90s you could still see the exhaust and the unburnt fuel and it popping and flaming coming into the corners um but nobody's really trying to do a blown diffuser as such like i think i think it was benetton in 95 who really tried to do it properly for the first time and started exploring the possibility of curing this when the drivers get off the throttle, the car becomes unstable problem. And it's really interesting what they were trying to do. So they actually have mention of trying some some clever engine maps to try and get around this. Yeah, well, and, and this sent me down a rabbit hole, if I'm going to be completely <laughs> honest, because we're talking about 95. And, and we have interviews with Schumacher talking about this and with Braun there. And um, one of the things that they did was they started what was called off throttle blowing in order to keep the exhaust gases flowing into the diffuser while the driver was off throttle or partially off throttle. And that's really, really clever because this is massively before its time of the hot blowing and subsequent, oh, sorry, sorry, cold blowing and subsequent hot blowing that we saw in the later 20s, sort of um, in, the, in the later sort of um, 2010s. But, but it's quite, it's quite pertinent to sort of read that they were having massive issues with it and they tried of all sorts of things like leaving the throttle bodies open when the driver gets off the throttle so you're trying to turn the engine into an air pump to keep the air coming in and it seems like that the, that they settled on ditching all of the clever engine mapping and trying to do clever stuff like this and just relying on the driver maybe changing their style to keep some partial throttle on in the corner to keep the exhaust gas energized and this can maybe explain why i remember back i remember very well in 95 there was schumacher had in 94, he had quite a few teammates and they eventually settled on Johnny Herbert, who was right. a teammate at the end of uh, 1994. But there was a gulf in performance. We're talking seconds between them on ultimate lap time and in the races. And yes, Johnny Herbert did manage to win a couple of races, but that was only when Schumacher had retired from, from the race. And this kind of the characteristic of the car can really kind of explain that because he managed to get around it and drive around it, but said quite openly in interviews that the car was a nightmare to drive and really, really difficult. And Poor Johnny Herbert jumping into it had a hard time getting his head around that. Yeah, well, it's kind of echoes of Ricardo and Norris a bit in terms of teammates. But I found it interesting that they had to talk Schumacher into sharing his traces with mm -hmm. Herbert 
And and he was like, no, I refuse to do that. And they're like, well, no, like we want him to, we want both of our cars to finish on the podium and they won't if we can't show him this because he can't figure it out by himself. <laughs> like it's such a counterintuitive driving style because if you come all the way off the throttle, you do lose those exhaust gases the way the car was set up back then. Yeah. And the car is on. The car is unstable, and now that can also help someone, like particularly like a driver like Schumacher. Vettel's a bit quite similar, and I think Verstappen's similar as well. Is they like it quite on the nose. They like a really positive front end to the car, so a bit of rear instability on the entry to the corner can be manipulated if you're brave enough to have the rear a bit loose, because that can give it a bit more of a pointy car. So if you can get it working in the window where you're comfortable, it can be absolutely mighty. But yeah, I find that interesting that he wasn't wanting to share his data, even though it was for the benefit of the team. They probably had to explain to him, look, your teammate coming third is, means a Williams isn't coming third as well, and it's going to make your life overall easier. But yeah, it's a very counterintuitive way of driving. You never really want throttle on when you're going into the corners. And this kind of harps back to how, why it kind of worked a bit better in the, using the, in the turbo era as well, because the drivers keep the turbo spooled, we're trying to use a lot of throttle. That's where Ayrton Senna's famous, you know, punchy throttle technique comes from. Yeah. To try to keep the turbo sport. It's constantly pop, 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 like hitting the throttle pedal, trying to keep it on. So, of course, that's naturally going to suit an exhaust going directly into the diffuser a little bit more because you're keeping it energized. But in 95 and seeing the difficulty they had of that Benetton probably explains why it wasn't more widespread used because I think quite a few teams played with it and the drivers were just like, I can't drive it. And this is summed up quite well with, Gerhard Berger, because obviously he, he moved to Benetton in 96, but they put him out in a 95 car as a test before this, and he come back and said it was undrivable. <laughs> he goes, I don't know how you <laughs> drive it. <laughs> so I think they actually went away from it from there on in. And also into the 90s with the engines, engine power started to become a major, major issue. They're all naturally aspirated, but the engine manufacturers, rather than having very long exhaust that you could place, the aero designs could place wherever they wanted, were kind of defining shorter and shorter lengths of exhaust pipes as well so well it it turns out that the length of the exhaust pipe is related to tuning the engine properly so depending upon mm -hmm. whatever technical regulations you're working with it wasn't always possible to get the exhaust directly to the diffuser which is a problem that teams begin trying to solve later on and they looked at doing things like running the exhaust down between the rear wheel and the diffuser to help seal it. We don't have skirts, but we could run a nice blast of hot air and we could keep the tire squirt from getting into the diffuser. And that's going to bring me back some performance. And all of these ideas, like I, I really want to get into cold and hot blowing. So we're going to get there in a second because like on <laughs> throttle overrun and why this came about and the way the power unit works, it's all just, ah, but yeah. But all of these ideas kind of coalesced in 2010 with the Red Bull. Yeah. And just before that, sorry, I'm going to keep you hanging at the door nope. there. No, nope, <laughs> that's all right. That, Make me go, wait. Fine. Yeah. Fine. <laughs> going to go back to um, when they sort of came away from exhaust blown diffusers again in the sort of the 90s with the short exhaust, as you say, and they're trying to either get it through the suspension or another easier way to do it. So you're not melting suspension components of the new use of carbon fiber suspension components was to do the top exiting exhausts. And I remember in 98 when Ferrari brought their top exiting exhaust blowing onto the rear wing. So they were so they were using the the exhaust blowing to aerodynamic benefit, but just onto the upper body work instead to get it away from there. And it was only when, again, like, you know, like maybe another subject we might get on and get onto a little bit later, maybe, uh, it sort of came about as of um, sort of rule changes and engineers trying to scrabble and find and find claw back some of the downforce that had been taken away from them. So obviously we go back to 2009, we yeah. suddenly have the massive aero changes and all of a sudden exhaust blown diffusers become a very, very um, nice hot and salad topic. Yeah, hot. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Hot topic. I can already, I've already got, yeah. So we can get onto lovely things like cold blowing and hot blowing. I can already hear Alex Van Jean sniggering at me saying hot blowing on a podcast. There's yes. all sorts of funny lewd terms you could use. But um, yeah, so in 2009, obviously they've just stolen a load of rear downforce and they've simplified the area rigs massively. They've got these horrible, tall, skinny rear wings now. And they've got these, um, sort of, they've got these diffusers which are now lending themselves quite nicely to fire the exhaust in. But most 
teams and people were staying quite traditional and keeping the exhaust on the upper bodywork facing up. But it was it was actually um, it was Adrian Newey and Red Bull in two thousand and nine at the end of 2009 i believe going to 2010 that really kicked off what i really consider was the true exhaust blown diffuser era yeah and i was just thinking as you were going through that one of my favorite things that i read was that when they when this idea first showed up naturally other teams wanted to ban it but when they looked at it because they wanted to call the throttle like a uh, moving or a dynamic device mm -hmm. or whatever but they realized that that if they tried to ban it they'd actually have to ban all exhausts which is why it stuck around <laughs> so long. Well, you could argue to the degree there, couldn't you? Because yeah, if you were banning exhaust, it goes, well, what's the movable part that's causing the airflow to move it? Well, it's the pistons. You can't ban pistons or the engine. I mean, <laughs> that's essentially what's causing the air to be moved. It's not the throttle, is it? Um, so, yeah, there was a whole rabbit hole. And was it, it was Collis, was it Colin Collis, I think, or the team yeah. that was trying to desperately get it banned on a movable aerodynamic yes. device. And oddly, I don't think they ever banned it on that in the end. I'm not sure it was actually banned for that in the end. They just pretty much made it impossible to use, which is their way of banning it. Well, it, I think really, um, if I'm remembering, if I'm remembering, I don't want to give too much away. It was banned, but it wasn't really. This is a tech that technically wasn't banned. It's just the regulations went someplace that it was no longer useful in the same way. That and they changed the, they moved the exhaust back up onto the center line. Mm -hmm. So, so you could use it to blow in between or to blow the rear wing, but there wasn't, there was no longer, you couldn't use the side pods and ramps and Kawanda to get the exhaust to blow down onto the diffuser and through the starter motor hole and stuff like that. They were up to at the, at the absolute technical height of, um, shenanigans that they got up to. And this is what really got me sort of excited about the subject. So I remember back to that era and, you know, in 2010 started noticing the cars sound different. Why do they sound odd on the onboard? And you can hear it. And then some of the offboard shots, and it's quite hard to see from some of the footage, but me as we had quite a keen ear on it. I was like, something sounds really, really weird. The Red Bull sounds funny. The McLaren sounds funny, like it's barking, having some intestinal issues on the way into the corners, very loud intestinal issues. Um, it's, 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 it's this bark, this rough sound. And it's like, what are they up to? And you can hear the difference between the cars. And this is them starting to move from cold blowing, which I think quite a few of them were doing all doing anyway, which is if we just explain cold blowing a bit, it's basically you want to try to energize and keep exhaust gases moving. So with cold blowing, it's basically when the driver comes off the throttle, they keep the throttle bodies open, which is allowing all of the air in, but they're cutting the ignition and cutting the fuel. So there's no fuel or ignition going in. You're just pumping, using the engine as an air pump, essentially. Right. And so now we're going to be talking about throttle overrun and engine braking. But before we do, I think we actually have some audio and or video, depending upon how you're consuming this, to uh, pay attention to that sort of illustrates how different they were. And to me, the sound is very reminiscent of how different all of our side pod designs are right now. They really did sound that different. And if you knew what you were about, you could tell who was coming just by listening to the previous corner. All right, that was ah, oh, that takes me back, man. That was so exciting <laughs> to listen to. Oh, it's awesome. I'm I feel very fortunate to actually go and see a Grand Prix live during this era, and that was at Silverstone in 2011. And you could really hear the difference and the bark. Now, the odd thing about that Grand Prix weekend was, of course, the FIA are very very upset about all of this hot blowing and cold blowing. They know it's going on. They don't like it. Only some teams are utilizing it. Ferrari never. They knew the effect of the blown diffusers, but they they haven't really got on top of the hot blowing or made it work properly. It was Red Bull and McLaren who are really, really running with it. And you can clearly hear, like on that audio clip, you can hear the first car that goes past, I believe is a Red Bull, and it's making, you can hear the bark on, on the throttle over and you can really, really hear it. The next car that comes through, I think is a Sauber, and it sounds vanilla. You can't hear it. You can't hear them running because they're not really doing the hot blowing. They're not really doing much on the exhaust, which is causing this crazy sound. And then you hear a McLaren, which is barking all over the top. And it's absolutely brilliant. And you can 
you can hear this. And when you're standing by the side of the track, it's really, really noticeable. And you can almost feel the rustiness of it. So this is what's making the crazy sounds here is the, is the hot blowing. So if we maybe explain hot blowing a bit, this is my understanding of it, Matt, is, is that if they, when the driver comes off the throttle, rather than just keeping the throttle bodies open and using the engine as an air pump, they're retarding the, the ignition, so they're not creating a spark, but they're also forcing some fuel into it. They're squirting some fuel in the cylinder, which is basically pumped through the engine with there isn't enough heat to combust it, all the way to the exhaust, which is extremely hot and hot enough to combust it, and it's combusting in the exhaust and obviously producing a massively energized stream of gas to come out of the exhaust off the throttle. And they're almost producing the same amount of gas off the throttle if, than they would be if they were on the throttle. And this is hugely powerful. And it was also hugely, hugely noticeable in the, in the notes of the engines. And one thing I found really interesting in, during this particular instance in Silverstone, as I mentioned, the FIA are really, really upset about this happening. For one race, they put a technical directive trying to limit all of, their, all of the ECU usage and to try to stop them doing this, mainly because Ferrari were moaning quite a lot at the time about it. And also, no, colors. really? <laughs> yes, they were moaning, and they weren't getting, and they weren't having much luck. Um, but you could hear the Red Bull; it was reduced on the Red Bull and the McLaren. But you could hear they were still up to it. One thing I found really funny was the Caterham, who were a back marker team at the time, but had a fairly good budget. They were clearly doing it; like they were so loud, and it was so audibly obvious that they were that they were clearly blowing massively. But I don't think anybody cared because they were at the back of the grid. Yeah, well, of course nobody cared. And and now we're getting into a wheelhouse that I absolutely love. I love finding out about this. So um, the estimates I saw for hot blowing were up to one second per lap. Wow. The problem you have with hot blowing is, of course, it uses extra fuel. Cold blowing, uh, the estimates I saw were three or four tenths a lap for cold blowing. But what I found really interesting was that this all comes from a place of how Formula One drivers brake and how the engines work. Because unlike how you would stop in a road car, say, you take your foot off the accelerator. If you're one of these people who uses their right foot for both, then you'd move it over to your brake. You're giving your engine ample time for the RPMs to spool down as you work your way down through the gears, either your automatic gear shifter or if you still drive a manual manually but formula one is the opposite drivers try to take advantage of maximum downforce so they smash the brakes because they have so much more stopping power and then they come off as they come into the turn but when they hit the brakes the stopping is so severe they will bounce down through a lot of gears very rapidly and if you make no allowance the vacuum that gets pulled in the cylinders as you've come off throttle and are braking, is enough to severely impact the reliability and the length of life of that power unit. Because it's not like the kind mm -hmm. of stress you're, because we're talking about engines at the time that were running around 18 to 20,000 RPM. Yeah. Crazy. And so if, if you're bouncing off of that and you're off throttle, you're just pulling huge vacuums and stressing it. So all of the teams were already on this would be called throttle overrun. They were already leaving open the valve so as not to blow their engine up every time their, their driver decelerated and used engine braking. And it also allowed them to do a better job with brake bias and stuff like that. So immediately when you had this protest, you had both Renault and Mercedes going like, hey, wait a minute, guys. I can show you engine traces from 2008 and 2009 where we had these exact same settings and we were doing this exact same thing. Nobody was complaining about it then. You can't just show up at one race and tell us suddenly we have to run our engines entirely differently. They will explode. And uh, that one race was about as long as it took for Charlie Whiting to <laughs> sort of see the obvious and say, well, well, yeah. And further to the point, like, you know, Ferrari could at any point do this exact same thing if that's what they chose to do. Um, so the issue kind of got kicked a little bit to the, to the following season where they redid the ECUs in such a way that you couldn't do that. Because I think Mercedes was like, um, they would retard the ignition, you mentioned, but it was like 45%. 
Yeah, it was huge. Yeah, it was it was massive. And I think Renault originally was was cold blowing. They would deactivate like half the cylinders and use that. Um but they were experimenting with the hot blowing too because it yielded so much more result if you got mm-hmm. it to work properly. Yeah. So I think in 2009, I think towards the end of 2009, they started experimenting with this. And this is also sort of the precursor, the start to the breakdown in the relationship. This this is one of the underlying niggles, the breakdown of the relationship between Renault and Red Bull. Remember, it started getting quite sour between them and quite toxic between them too when the relationship was breaking down, particularly when we moved to the turbo hybrid era. But one of the gripes from Renault was that they said that Red Bull never credited them enough for the work that they did with all of these aggressive engine maps. And essentially, they they were the pioneers. With them and Red Bull, they both pioneered this modern exhaust blown diffuser and this off throttle blowing. And they and they solved the problem and gave the huge performance benefits. And Renault were unhappy that they never really got credited with it and then got thrown under the bus when they screwed up their turbo engine. And this was kind of the seeds were sown for the bitterness in the relationship there. But the work that Renault did shouldn't go unmentioned because it was quite incredible with their exhaust maps. And obviously Mercedes cottoned onto it. But back in 2009, yeah, they were doing this cold blowing quite a lot. And it was only in 2010 and 11 where they really started to get into the hot blowing. And we started to hear these crazy exhaust notes that we heard earlier. But it's um, and it's really interesting because they were doing it in different ways, as you mentioned earlier. They they were angling the exhausts and aiming at different bits of the diffuser to try to get the most from it. Yeah, and and one of the things I did want to mention, like we're, if we're going to talk about the twenty thousand ten Red Bull, and I might have this wrong, so you feel free to connect, correct me if I did. Mm-hmm. But isn't that the one that showed up to the last day of testing with the exhaust in a completely different location? <laughs> And that they'd even like put stickers where the old exhausts were to try and confuse people. Yes, amazing. It was like the <laughs> ultimate troll. It was absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Love it. And the exhaust, it gets, there are pictures you could always see. It gets, it looks really, really good. I mean, yeah. I mean, you'd have to have a very eagle eye to actually notice, like, hang on a minute. No, that's just a sticker. So this is, and this is tantamount to their simulations and how confident they must have been because they hadn't run it. And they hadn't run it at all in testing until the very last day. So they must have been very confident. So, of course, with their, with their, um, with their upward-facing exhaust, they can still tune the engine maps. So they were still trying to get these engine maps and trying to measure the exhaust flows coming out of it, but just didn't have the exhaust in the right place. Now, from our understanding, they're not in this era, they weren't firing the exhaust straight into the diffuser itself. I think back in 2009 or 2010, they were firing it next to the diffuser and maybe getting some of the air to go in via a hole? Yeah, the starter motor hole. Mm. The only allowable hole in the diffuser was for the starter motor, and Nui was clever enough to vertically extend that so that air being ramped from the exhaust would pass both above the diffuser, which had been, it had been discovered, like I said, that another way to use that exhaust was to run it atop the diffuser, put a gurney flap at the end of the diffuser, and that resulting flow of air would help extract the flow from the diffuser, making it more efficient. But what Nui realized was that he could actually split the exhaust, get some of it to run down through the starter motor hole to energize the airflow and help with the boundary layer down there, and then get the rest of it to run above, thereby giving him a, like a double bite at that apple of increasing the efficiency of that diffuser. Nice. So it's like a double whammy. And I would imagine they really took the, because uh, it's for the starter motor. So they're allowed to have a hole in the diffuser for the starter motor. So I imagine they come up with all sorts of fancy shapes for that hole and weird shaped starter motors so they can make the hole whichever size they wanted. So yes, we have a very peculiar, very weird vertically slotted starter motor that has to have a hole in the diffuser so it can fit through. That's just the way, is it? So I think this is in the Mark Priestley book, where they were going on about crazy shaped holes in the diffuser for the starter motors. And it was for exactly this reason to try to use and exploit the exhaust blown diffuser effect. So this was then closed, I believe, in 2010, wasn't it? The FIA cottoned onto this and were like, no, you're not allowed to blow into this. Oh no, oh, no that was 2011, sorry, wasn't it? So at the end of 2010, right. they were like, right, you can't do this. We know exactly what you're doing and we're not being taken for idiots anymore. You're not allowed to have a hole 
well, you're not allowed to blow in that hole. And they moved the location of the hole and limited the size of the hole of the starter motor, I believe, that they yeah. have. So now Red Bull are like, right, so how are we going to utilize this? So they're basically then creating a virtual skirt, a hot gas skirt around the side of the diffuser then. They and McLaren it, both, but they took very different approaches to it. Ah, yes. So this is the, this is the, is this the, because I remember the winter of 2011 and they were going on about McLaren having this crazy complicated exhaust system, which I think they dubbed the octopus and they could yeah. never get it to work. And I think they ditched it even before they got it. It never got raced. They got to the first race and basically just whacked their exhaust down where they thought Red Bull had them and it just seemed to work. But yeah, so they were trying to, I believe they were trying to make the exhaust into the floor into a really strange elongated nozzle shape. But of course, Inconel exhausts and carbon fiber floors flex at different rates. So it was very difficult to make work. Yeah. And it's always, I mean, so here's what I love. We have Adrian Newey, Newey who was floating around even back in the 90s, messing around with this, going from Williams to McLaren. And I always, and it was Mark Priestley, I think, that, that wrote about, because it never went away, even when the exhausts weren't being routed in the diffusers. They were being aimed at that gap between the rear wheel and the diffuser to help to help seal it. And there was always rumored to be, and I think Priestley wrote about it in his book, there was a McLaren that never saw the light of day because it always caught fire. And I can't help but thinking this is Newey with the cleverest idea in the world, but not quite the materials to make it happen. Yes. Is this the this is the dreaded MP418? the New East yes. car that was pretty much swept under the carpet, which became yes. the 2004 car. But like, yeah. Um, yeah. And I think some of the major problems of that was probably him trying to be very clever with the exhaust and the diffuser linked in and it didn't quite work and the technology is not quite there for it. So, so yeah, so we've pretty much covered, we've done the 2009, we've done the 2010 at the end of 2011, all of these crazy, these, the, these crazy maps are going on. The FAA is like, right. <laughs> Like, look, you've had your fun. We've had enough. We are going to make exhaust blowing impossible. We're not going to ban it, but we're going to make it impossible for you to do. We're going to move the exhaust up and angled so you can't possibly get that air anywhere near the diffuser. And, and the F1 engineers were like, hold my beer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and this comes on to the Coanda effect. Yes. It? And the brilliant spoon that you mentioned, the spoon. So there was an exper a fun experiment that you can do at home to actually visualize the Coanda effect and how air sticks to a surface and will follow a contour to a certain effect. So if you get a spoon, turn it the other way, so the back of the spoon is facing down, and go to your kitchen sink, turn on your tap, and have quite a high-pressure stream of water, and gently move the back of your spoon to the water, and notice what happens. The water will essentially stick to the back of the spoon, follow the contour, and the water coming off the bottom of the spoon will be pointing in a different direction. And that's the Coanda effect. It's the fluid which air can be considered in these cases as a fluid attaching to the surface and following that contour of the surface and the f1 engineers brilliantly utilized this to even though the fa had stipulated that the exhaust have to be facing upward at an angle and nowhere near the diffuser had used this coanda effect and these channels cut out and body effects to manage to to bend the exhaust gas by this invisible force right where they wanted it yeah, and this is the difference the, between the McLaren and the Red Bull at this point, because McLaren was using more of a downwash and a ramp down the side pod to get the air to go between the rear wheel and the diffuser. But Adrian Newey didn't want to give up running the air on top of the boat tail and the gurney mm -hmm. flap at the back of the diffuser. So Red Bull actually established this crossover tunnel that they, they spent about half the season developing to get to work right. And I think Sauber tried to copy it and, and just gave up. It was too much money for them to make happen. But once they got it working, they had a car that was more efficient than anybody else's because they were, again, able to get more efficiency out of running the air this way. And they did stuff too, like I'm going to... I. I going to talk about this real quick hmm. um summer sent us this research about the resonator chamber right yeah. so we talked about one of the difficulties being managing the airflow when you are off throttle and they took away off throttle blowing basically with the ecu yeah they they basically present 
and prevented you going more than was it thirty percent or twenty? Yeah, yeah, you it was, do not, it it was not a big amount. Yeah, they they made it impossible to push fuel through and ignite in the exhaust, basically. Yeah, and and so you could keep it open to preserve your engine, but you weren't going to get that same like you know seventy five percent benefit that you were previously seeing when you could have have the cylinder and have the throttle bodies open like ninety percent and run air through there. So what Red Bull did in order to help with this is they extended a vertical pipe above the exhaust. So when I'm on full throttle, some of my exhaust goes up into that chamber and that air is compressed by the power of the exhaust. As I come off throttle, that air under pressure now is coming back down from that resonator and exiting the exhaust and pulling air through while I'm off throttle, giving me the benefit of cold blowing where I, I'm not technically allowed to have it by the ECU. And this is, I mean, just details like that are why I love this technical aspect of the sport so much. And, you know, and it's, it's sad that it all got said goodbye to in, yeah. in 2014. I, I think the FIA just sort of realized so much money had been spent making these unbelievably complicated exhaust work that it was actually probably cheaper for the teams to let them exist through the yes. 2013 season, knowing that the hybrid regulations would force them to rethink it entirely and, and go a different direction. Yes, they were going to turn a blind eye because they're like, okay, in 2012, we thought we made it impossible and you, <laughs> you completely, um, yeah, you completely outbought us there. Um, and so for 2013, knowing the hybrid regulations are going to come with the, and that's another thing with the hybrid regulations was a single exhaust pipe has to exit almost past the rear wing. They, they were still trying to cover off any available sort of opportunities for the engineers to try to utilize these exhaust gases. And they put it in a place where, yeah, surely they can't utilize them now. But of course, with the single pipe, the engineers, you're not going to forget that you can utilize this, this wonderful high, high energy air. So it hasn't really gone away, the exhaust blowing. They're, they're trying to angle it up and blow the bottom of the well, rear the, wing now. And between the beam wing and the, mm -hmm. and, and, and the, and the rear wing is, is yeah. not too different than the gurney flap on top of the diffuser in terms of increasing the efficiency of the diffuser. Ah, Formula One never forgets the tricks it learns. It, it always had, the knowledge is always there in, in Derek's desk drawer somewhere and someone's <laughs> going to open it up and find it. But all of the aerodynamic tricks they discovered bending the air to make these exhausts work are still being used on today's cars to make all of these things work even more efficiently. Kyle, thanks for coming along. That was really, really fun. Uh, maybe, I was maybe a bit disjointed. It's just, it's just hard to, to try to convey all of these ideas when we're sitting in a, you know, sort of um, a sweet shop of ideas and research and all this cool stuff that I just want to talk about over many so many months. shiny distracting <laughs> objects. Yes. Yes. And I guess I, I mean, I, I hate to say this was a technical failure, but getting to the end, I realized that they sort of didn't quite ban this technology more than just make it impossible. So I tell you what, next time we'll pick something they actually banned. How about that? That sounds like that sounds like a really good idea. Cause as you say, yeah, they kind of they've made this impossible. Is there a word of making something impossible but not directly banning it? We need to come up with a word for that, but yeah, we can. Maybe we'll have to do more research. Clearly, yeah, <laughs> maybe, we can maybe explore something that's a bit more of a slam dunk next time. <laughs> all right, thanks again, and that's all from us. Let's head back to Spanners in the shed. We're often accused here on Missed Apex Podcast of being far too. F1 centric. Hey, it is an F1 podcast after all. However, there is a world of motorsport out there. And if the 40,000 Formula One races scheduled in the modern era aren't enough for you, there is a whole wealth of junior series below Formula One as well. And to my to my sins, I have never kept up with it as much as I should. Anytime I have tuned in, I've enjoyed the racing, so I berate myself a lot for not getting more into it. But to try and redress that balance and persuade me to keep more of an eye on the Junior Series, I've got Formula Nerds representative Samuel Coop joining me in the shed. Hey, Samuel. Hey, how's it going? You all right? Yeah, no, good, man. I mean, I heard the controversies with, with Formula 3. I know there's a little bit more to fight for in Formula 2. So I was hoping I could just pick your brains and pick your knowledge. Firstly, how's things going at Formula Nerds? 
Yeah, all good. Yeah, yeah. Um, continue to grow. Um, you know, looking forward to you know the next kind of things that we're gonna uh, tackle. Ooh. The podcast is doing well. Ooh. So yeah. No, oh, I tried. Yeah, I mean, to... I got got to get in there. <laughs> oh no, you're the second rival podcast we've interviewed on the show, guys. Just because I bring you a wealth of content creators doesn't mean you're allowed to uh, abandon us. Stay loyal to Mr. Apex and the Shed. Uh, but Formula Nerd is a, it's a great, fun organisation and always very informative as well. So tell me, what's what happened in F3? The F3 season was incredibly close in the drivers' championship. Uh, in fact, it, the final round in Monza in September. Going into that weekend, seven drivers still could have taken the, the crown. Really? Which wow. is, is nuts. Out, out of you know, 30 cars, obviously, it's a, a bigger field. To have you know, that number within yeah. contention, and you know, they lost one over the weekend, but the final race could have gone either, you know, any way. So when so there's been... that many drivers in contention, I always think that is the mark of a very competitive series. Yeah. So like, when you see, like even in tennis, when you see, oh, some... Some bloke wins like 20 grand slam. You go, doesn't say a lot for the field really, does it? But what sort of age are these F3 drivers? And, and is that a true reflection that, that it is a tight talent pool at the moment? Oh, it absolutely is a tight talent pool. The, the one, I guess, caveat to that is that you've got drivers who are in the second or third seasons who may be slightly older, uh, more experienced, know the car better. So they've you know made gains each year. But you have 16, 17 year olds in there. Ollie Behrman, who became very close to winning the title this year, came third, mm. was 16 at the start of the year. Oh, really? That's frightening then, actually. That puts a whole new, especially for the dads and mums and dads of teenagers listening. When you go look at those F3 cars flying around and you go, that's 16 year olds. Yeah. That really does put it in a different perspective. Oh, it's, it's, it's insane. It's. Mm. You know, sticking 30 teenagers on a racetrack in a car that goes 170 plus miles an hour is it's, it's amazing. I do remember absurd. once I was stood at Luffield and uh, it was, um, I think it was WEC and it was one of the support series. Am I making that up? Did they used to support WEC at some point? It was the six hours of Silverstone. But I saw one of these junior formula cars flying off the gravel and into the wall at Luffield. And then literally the kid gets out, takes his helmet off and you go, oh my, it's a baby. What's a baby doing flying around in those cars? Oh yeah, it's 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 insane. You know, some of the drivers, you know, be it seventeen, look yeah. twelve. <laughs> yeah, it's really odd. But yeah, I mean, a few of them are kind of into their early twenties. They're oh, the okay. more experienced guys who are looking to move up. So there's there is a there is a range of of age there. Oh, is there an upward age limit? Is it too late for me, Sam, at forty two? It's technically not too late. Uh, for you, um, if you've if you've got the backing, oh, um, no. financially, okay, <laughs> uh, and and you know supportively from your your family. <laughs> okay, so let's say actually this is an interesting question. I didn't mean to divert down this path, but let's say I'm having a midlife crisis. Let's pretend I'm having a midlife crisis, and I I'm, I win the lottery. What can I? What do I need to just walk into an F three team, assuming I can get my licenses? Assuming you can get your licenses, you well. You, You'll want sponsorship because you're oh, going to want to keep okay, some of that lottery money. Okay. You, you want backers. Mm. Um, you've also got to prove you're quick. If you're not quick, they're not going to put you in the car. No problem. Uh, so I've not... done I've done sim racing, which, as we've established on the show, is exactly the same as being a real race driver. Don't ruin that for me. <laughs> oh, completely. Oh, yeah. You, you you'll be absolutely fine. In fact, you know you'll be competitive within a couple. There of we go. So uh, I've got four million in my pocket. Can I get a season in? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I'd, I'd say so. Yeah. Uh, One million. We're haggling now. It's getting, we're, getting, we're getting, yeah, getting time. Okay, so I do need that, that lottery win to get me there unless anyone wants to sponsor me. Uh, so <laughs> apart from the seven drivers in contention, uh, who, who was our winner in F3 then? So Victor Martins won the, the title and won it in controversial, Ooh, stressful... Go on, tell me, tell me, tell me. ...of the 2022 season <laughs> way. So final race, you've got... Victor Martins is third behind Oli Behrman and Zay Maloney who are second and third in the championship so the front three are at the, at the front of the race about four laps ago one of the other drivers um, Kush Miney, puts the car into the wall oh no and you're like oh this is going to close up the field <laughs> it's you know and Victor was kind of starting to slip back he was managing the race doing enough yeah, you know, eventually, first of all, goes to yellows, then mm. safety car, then red flag. Uh oh. 
and so they all come into the pit lane and everyone is tense and then track limit penalties start trickling through for the field including for victor martins so he gets a five second penalty why were they all is, getting penalties then because they've just been exceeding oh, the track right, limits. I see. Oh, so they, it was and, just the, the stewards catching up with these natural yeah. offences. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. So these start trickling in. Victor Marsons gets a five-second penalty that bumps him down to fifth or, or somewhere. A couple of drivers get two track limit penalties, you know, totaling 10 seconds. And you're thinking, well, if that happens to Victor, this is this is done. This is it's over. And, you know, there's four laps left. There's no way he's going to be able to make that time up. And he's afterwards said that he was furious with his team at this point because they hadn't told him or he felt in advance enough so that he could stop kind of you know doing that violation and then it comes through that the race will not be restarted and so with four laps to go because over an f1 race weekend mm. you've got f2 you've got f3 uh you know a mm. number of events it's like clockwork that you have to get the racing done within a set window. oh so they ran out of time they essentially, yeah, run out of time. Yeah. What this then led to is, so Zay Maloney wins the race. Oli Behrman second. Victor Martin has been demoted down to fifth. And there's, you know, making sure all the penalties are done, everything like that, so that they know the final finishing order to try and determine the, cha the champion. And you've got, it was about 20 minutes or so. And there's just chaos. No one quite knows who's won. It's like... Victor starts looking kind of quite confident and then he's looking a bit worried and then like, so it wasn't the prettiest ending, but <laughs> yeah. to the FIA and F3's credit, it was the correct result and they took the time to make sure that everything was above board. Um, and yeah, the, the, you, you can't question it from that perspective. So that was nice to see, albeit not in the car. Ah, it's just, you want it to be clean, don't it? You want the you want the drivers to cross the line, the teams to say, hey, you're you're the champion, congratulations. Uh, but, you know, you got it in the end and it, no one's disputing that it was the right result in the end? No, absolutely no. not. Um, it was the correct result. And interestingly, when going over to the Alpine lot, because Vix Martins is part of the Alpine Driver Academy, uh, he said to Megan White of Autosport, I was really worried that what happened to Hamilton would hap would happen to me. Oh, which yeah, is a fascinating soundbite because clearly that has is is, mm. is 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 kind of soaked into the consciousness of the drivers. Even the junior series drivers are looking at this and going, "If if it's not really clear who's won on track, they could just take it." Oh, yeah. I'm a bit unsure here. So, I thought that was a fascinating. Um, comment and obviously that riled up the whole kind of Abu Dhabi um again to be honest that is a very easy thing to do I've I've seen arguments over pizza descend into it's the new Godwin's law isn't it of F yeah. F1 any argument an online debate will inevitably go to Abu Dhabi 2021 are things a little bit cleaner in F2 I know there's still uh, still the title to fight for yes so there's still the team's championship to, to fight for in Abu Dhabi the drivers' championship is wrapped up and was also wrapped up um, in Monza the day before, so on on the on the Saturday, um, and that again was it was an interesting one because uh, early in the race, Felipe Drogovic, who had a, a commanding lead in the championship by this point, he had a, a brilliant triple header where Teo Porcher had everything had kind of fallen apart at the seams, which was a real shame because he had a great end to the summer period it looked like the momentum was with him and it, you know there was 21 points in it with three rounds to you know four rounds to go all kind of fell apart for Teo Felipe got hit on the first lap retired so he sat there on the pit wall knowing that Teo Porsche had to finish sixth I think to keep the championship alive by the mm. barest of margins Teo made a you know a couple of mistakes fell back and I I think he just about finished, but with mm. a damaged car. So Felipe won it on the pit, and sitting he's... there watching the race. <laughs> well, that's, you know, you think it's anticlimactic when Lewis Hamilton picked up titles in, in Mexico, the podiums going on around them, and then they present him the trophy on the floor, on the ground. Do you think we should start implementing a thing where we focus on the champion and like delay the podium? Because <laughs> the podium's going on and there's just some dude on a pit wall going, yay. 
They should do. And in fairness, the, the coverage did focus on Felipe and, and he was great. He kind of turned <laughs> around, gave everyone, all the photographers, the photos they wanted and kind of all that stuff. <laughs> he also made his way to the podium to, to celebrate because obviously Monza has that amazing podium that yeah. know, overlooks the uh, start finish straight. And then they, they put on uh, Champions press conferences in addition to the, the usual top three stuff. So they, they do their dues. So what happens to our, our champions now? What, what future do they have? So Victor Martins can't stay. So they, they can't stay in their current formula. Yeah. Um, it's a you know, win and progress um, system, which makes sense. And Bruno Michel, the CEO of F2 and F3, stands by that, rightly so. Um, so Victor Martins can't stay in F, F3. He's got to move up to F2. So where he will land is yet to be determined. You would think he'd stay with uh, ART, but will he? Fred Vesti's got one seat. Terry Porcher will move on. There's a couple of other names potentially in the mix for, for ART. So I think Victor needs to get his funding in place. Uh, Felipe Drogovic, as as we know, has signed on to the Aston Martin Young Driver Programme, uh -huh. newly created um, development programme. But Lucas de Grassi is trying to get Felipe Drogovic a Formula E seat for next season. Uh, so Felipe Drogovic was saying that basically, if you're not testing loads as well as being reserve, that's really bad for a driver. So you, you'd you want to be in a another championship as well as being a reserve driver. Well, that worked out for Alex Albon. I don't think he technically drove a race, did he? But he, he was contracted in Formula E and then he got the opportunity. He, in, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, then Nick de Vries is obviously gone and shown that that is not a dead end anymore. So might we see this a bit more where Formula E becomes a holding ground for the Piastris and such like? I, I think there is a potential there. Mm -hmm. um, Formula E more so than IndyCar. But I also think it's not a, a desired effect. I think it's the, it's too difficult for the champions of Formula 2 and the best drivers to get F1 seats. There's mm. a stagnation there. Well, the, the latest rumour I'm hearing is that 35-year-old uh, out two seasons out of practice, super sub Nico Hulkenberg is being considered for the Haas seat, and that has got to be a big head bob of just despair for the junior drivers to go. He's Nico had his chance. Yeah, he, yeah. He he was he was a great driver. He was very popular. He never had that X factor though, did he? Let's face it. He never had solid though. In those, he was solid. He, he was solid, mm. but in those critical moments, he he couldn't quite get it over the line. And mm. for Haas, you've got Kevin Magnussen. Yeah. You've got that experience. You've already got your well, Hulkenberg. Of... You've already got the Hulkenberg. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you've got a slightly better Hulkenberg, in my opinion. Uh -huh. So why not bring youth in? Yeah. Has Schumacher done enough to stay? I don't think That's so. That's debatable. I personally don't yeah. either. Uh, but, but yes, you're right. When you've got the experience there, you've got your, um, your standard candle in Kevin Magnussen. You know what he is. Why not then you know, bring through a, a, a kid from F2? with the enough super license points. Are there kids there? I keep saying kids. Are there young drivers with the super license points ready to go into F1? Yes, there are. Yeah. So Felipe Drogovic, by virtue of winning it, he could take a seat. So whether or not Aston Martin decide to loan him. Oh, to, you know, yes. Uh, and again, I, that hasn't been spoken about at all. That's you know, just you. Felipe guessing. Drogovic. <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know, as a winner, he gets the most super license points. Logan Sargent is a name that is coming up a lot in the Williams conversation. He's part of their Young Driver Academy. And enough super license points are well within, within his grasp in Abu Dhabi. So you should see that happening. Um, at least him being able to race. Whether or not Williams decide to go for, say, a Mick Schumacher remains to be seen. I think they should go for Sargent personally. Um, and then you've got Jack Dewan, who is the next man up in the Alpine Driver Academy. So obviously Oscar Piastri has been shuffled out or shuffled himself out rather. Yeah. Um, Leapt out. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Ran away <laughs> screaming uh, from uh, a dysfunctional family, it seemed, uh, by his accounts. Um, but Jack Dewan is, is the next man up and he is very, very quick. He's 19. He's the son of Mick Dewan, who's obviously the mm. very, very famous uh, motorcycle racer. And Obviously, he's not going to be in the Alpine car because they've got Gasly, Gasly in that seat now. But could he be loaned out somewhere? Yeah, who knows? Could he be, you know, graduating to F1? Well, this is the kind of thing that we need you for, Sam. And I, I definitely think going forward and perhaps like next season, I'll try and make sure we get more regular updates of what's going on in the Junior Series so that when I tune in at the weekend, I'm, I'm, I'm invested 
in what's going on and who to look out for. I think that's key. Uh, Check out the show notes below for all of Sam's social media and for all the Formula Nerd stuff. Thank you very much for joining us here today on Missed Apex Podcast. We are going to be back on Sunday at 4 p.m. UK time-ish. We're going to be doing a mailbag show but with a special guest, Alex Brundle, is going to be joining us to answer your questions. So send them into feedback at mistapex.net. Until we see you next, work hard, be kind, and have fun. This was Missed Apex Podcast. Thank <laughs> you.